You are listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby of Torch in Houston, Texas. This is the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. All right, welcome back everybody to the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. Today we're going to continue with the Talmud in Tractate Shabbat 31a. Last time we met, which was two weeks ago because last week was the holiday of Shavuot, so we talked about the greatness of Hillel. Now we're going to continue that same Talmud uh, that talks about the greatness of Hillel with two new stories. So the Brisa shows how Hillel's exceptional humility succeeded in bringing others closer to God. Tana Rabbanon, the rabbis taught in a Brisa, Maisa Benachri Echot Shabal Lifnei Shammai. There was once a Gentile who came before Shammai. Omerlo, he said to him, Kama Torahs Yeshlechem. How many Torahs do you Jews have? Omerlo, Shammai replied to him, Shtayim, we have two Torahs. Torahs Shabachtav, Torahs Shabal Peh, the written Torah and the oral Torah. Omar Lo, the Gentile, then said to him, As for the Torah that is written, I believe you, that it is given by God. But the concerning the Torah that is oral, I don't believe you that this is a God-given document, meaning I don't trust that the tenets of the oral Torah were revealed by God like the written Torah. And then he says to Shammai, Convert me to Judaism on that which I shall be bound by only its tenets in the written Torah. Only by the written Torah. You'll teach me only the written Torah, and that's enough. And I'm not going to take the oral Torah. Gar bova hotzio b'nezifa. Upon hearing this, Shammai berated him for his insolence and sent him away disapprovingly. Balif ne Hillel, afterwards, the same Gentile came in front of Hillel with the same request, and Gaire, and Hillel converted him. So the Gemara teaches elsewhere that when a candidate for conversion specifically rejects a certain part of the Torah, although he may wholeheartedly accept the rest, he must be rejected, and Shammai's reject- rejection was based upon that dictum. So this is appropriate what Shammai did. However, what do we see about Hillel? Hillel felt that the person did not qualify as one who rejects part of the Torah. For his non-acceptance of the oral Torah's divine origin was based on ignorance, not conviction. Hillel felt confident that in time he would be able to dispel the person's doubts and he therefore proceeded with his conversion. So there's something very important about this. Many times People say or people accuse others of being intentional sinners. Oh, are you telling me, Rabbi, that if someone drives on Shabbos, that they can still be they they can still be counted as part of the uh, the the community? And I said, yes, absolutely. You mean you can count them part of a minion? Yes, absolutely. You mean you? Yes. Why? Why? Because I firmly believe that there's not a human being alive today who would desecrate the Shabbos if they knew what Shabbos was all about. I firmly believe that no one in their right mind would take the most pleasurable thing on earth and desecrate it. It's impossible. We're we're living in a world where the entire civilization is obsessed with finding pleasure. And you're telling me that the most pleasurable thing on planet earth will be desecrated? It's impossible. The only reason someone would desecrate it is because they don't know its value. They don't know what it is. They've never experienced it. So I had recently someone challenged me. He says, are you telling me that someone who grew up in a religious home and left the life of observance, are you telling me that he doesn't either know? I said, absolutely, he doesn't know. Why? Why do I say that? Because I know many people who grew up in a, quote, observant, Shabbos observant home, who didn't who don't keep it and i can tell you that if not every single one the vast majority only heard one thing about shabbos the things you're prohibited of doing on shabbos they didn't hear about the beauty of the shabbos they didn't hear about the joy of shabbos they didn't hear about the things you're permitted to do on shabbos it's not everything about what's prohibited the prohibitions as we said prohibitions 
in the Torah are only things that preserve your holiness. It's to preserve your holiness and protect you from falling away from godliness. However, what is the performative commandments of the Torah? The performative commandments of the Torah are things that bring you closer to God. The, what we see about Shabbos is Shamar, watch over the Shabbos. Zohar, remember the Shabbos, brings you closer to God. It brings you closer to your source being Shabbos. So, therefore, I, in a way, I mean, obviously, we see that Hillel is praised constantly because of his ability to always see the virtue in another person. He was always, first is, they also, he also had a great deal of respect for Shammai, even though we don't hold like Shammai in most situations, we follow the opinion of Hillel. Also, we see that Hillel always allowed Shammai to speak first. Don't just jump because you have a different opinion. Take the other opinion in, listen to it, evaluate it, and then offer an alternative when you don't agree. Yes. So anybody who disagrees with the fundamental principles of the Torah, like that the Torah was given at Mount Sinai, or taking the Torah literally and not uh, not in a full package. I'll give you an example. It's impossible to observe the Torah without understanding, without including the oral Torah. It's impossible. And we'll see in the next story about Hillel how he demonstrates that. But it is impossible. We gave many examples of this in the past. The Torah commands us only what to do, but not how to do. So the Torah tells us to slaughter an animal. It doesn't tell us how to slaughter an animal. The Torah tells us to put a mezuzah on our door. It doesn't say what a mezuzah is even. The Torah says to put on tefillin. It doesn't tell you what tefillin are. The Torah tells you so many things. That's just a few of them. But if you look at the majority of the commandments, there's no explanation to what they are. Okay, very nice. We know because we went to day school and we learned what a mezuzah is. But who told us what a mezuzah is? The Torah doesn't say it. So if you follow literally the letter of the Torah, law, without any of the oral transmission that was given, by the way, to Moshe at Mount Sinai, you know, we have a class here every week where we outline in those classes we have, for example, we have the Parsha Review Podcast, where every week we have a handout that we give out the summary of the Parsha. That's not the Torah. That's my man-made cliff notes of the Parsha Review. So if you go with that document and say, hey, this is everything I need to know, that's wrong. That's not true. Because if you listen, to read that document, to read it yourself will take you four minutes. At most. But how come the class takes 30, 40, 50 minutes at times? Because we speak out so much orally that is not written on that paper. This is just a summary. The Torah is just a summary of everything else that Hashem taught us orally. To Moshe. So accepting just the written Torah without the oral Torah is you're missing you're missing the whole thing. So therefore it is impossible for someone like you mentioned the Karaites it is impossible to observe the Torah without the oral Torah. The written Torah must come along with an oral Torah. So the question is so why does it need to be distributed orally and then when we look at this Talmud which is written this is part of the oral law. So why is the oral law written? Because people were losing the transmission of the Torah. Rabbeinu HaKadosh, who wrote the first piece of oral Torah down in the Mishnah, in the order of in the six orders of the Mishnah, this is exactly what he was trying to prevent. He was trying to prevent people forgetting and losing the connection with the oral explanations to everything. The reason why things were orally transmitted and not written Firstly, is because Hashem chose that things not be written. But Moshe had his own notebook, and Aaron has had his own notebook. And the elders and the prophets, they all had their own notebooks 
of those oral transmissions and those oral teachings that were given from Moshe at Mount Sinai. And then given from the elders. And then given from the men of the great assembly, etc., etc. Until Rabbi Noah compiled them all and composed, I would say, but put together the entire Mishnah. Then we have the Mishnah. The Mishnah is elaborated on even while Rabbi Noah was still alive, they already started elaborating on the Mishnah, which is the Talmud. And then we have the Talmud discussions and arguments and conclusions that lead us to Halacha, where the Rambam went through every single Mishnah, every single Talmud, every single conclusion, and then compiles all of the Halacha. So it's not that, and by the way, every piece of that oral transmission that was given has a biblical source. So there's no such thing as just rabbis saying, oh, I heard this from my rabbi, and therefore it is. You have to bring a source for it. Where is it backed up in the Torah? In the written Torah. And the Talmud won't accept an argument which says, just take my word for it. There's no such thing. No taking anybody's word for it. It needs to be written in the Torah. Okay. So the Bryce relates the end of the story. Yoma, Kama, Amar one day, Hillel taught the Aleph Bet to the new convert, saying to him, Aleph, Beis, Gimel, Dalit, saying the letters of the Aleph Bet in order. Lamachar, but on the following day when the convert came for the next lesson, Apichle, Hillel reversed the name of the letters for him, teaching him that the letter he called Aleph today, yesterday, is now called Taf, and so on. See, he taught it in the reverse order. Omar lay, taken aback by the change, the convert said to Hillel, uh, Yesterday you said differently. What are you doing today? Today you're reversing everything? Yesterday you said this was Aleph. Now you say it's tough. Last, yesterday you said that this was a, a shin, and now you're saying it's a base. What is going on here? Amr Lo Hill replied to him, So you see then, are you not relying upon me to recognize the letters of the alphabet? The Alpe Nami Samich Ale. Rely on me also then about the veracity of the oral Torah. Meaning, if you're trusting me to teach you Aleph is Aleph and Bet is Bet and Gimel is Gimel, then when I tell you what mezuzah means, you also have to rely on me. Therefore, what he's trying to say is, not rely on me because I'm a great guy and my name is Hillel. That's not the objective here. The objective here is you have to understand that if there is an oral transmission that is given down from Moshe at Mount Sinai, there always has to be a link connecting it. You were just randomly accepting for me that I said Aleph means Aleph. Like, for example, so what color is this? Well, exactly. It's whatever we were taught in preschool is the color that it is. Now, what's if they told you that this was purple? Then they taught you wrong. But Well, that's the tradition you have. Now, here's the thing, is that if enough people know that this is gray or silver, then it's going to be gray or silver because that's what we all understand that it is. Okay? If enough people understand the correct way of, under, of learning the Torah and understanding the Torah, that's going to be exactly the same thing. And what we see is with the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, the Jewish people stood at the foot of Mount Sinai, and Hashem says, giving us all of the commandments, Hashem tells us exactly what the, what the explanation is for everything, for each and everything. We've brought many examples over the years in our Talmud class here of different mitzvahs, different commandments, different teachings that are linked to a direct transmission, but there will always be a source connecting it to the Torah, a biblical written source to the Torah. So one of the examples we can, we can br- bring out here, you know, there are seven, six or seven laws that are completely rabbinic in nature. 
completely rabbinic in nature. For example, washing your hands. Washing your hands is completely rabbinic in nature. So how can the rabbis make up? Rabbi, you just said five minutes ago on this podcast, right here, you said that the rabbis have no authority to make up any rules. How can they make up these rules? Now you're saying it's just six or seven rules. How can they make up any rules? The answer is that look at what the rabbis did. The rabbis said that you should wash your hands. Why? Because they link it to activities that are guided in the Torah with washing hands. Anything you do that is holy, that is sanctified, that is done in the temple, for example, before the Kohen did any service in the temple, they had to wash their hands. So what do we learn from that? Eating that is considered to be like an offering, oh, you should do the same thing, wash your hands. So what did the rabbis do? The rabbis did make up a rule, but that entire rule is based on what the Torah already tells us regarding the same exact matter in the temple. So when the Torah tells us not to sit or stand on a table, you're not supposed to sit on a table. Why not? Because the table is considered like a shulchan. It's supposed to be like an altar. Just like the altar, people didn't just casually lay on the altar in the temple because it's a holy a holy thing, so too, we don't sit on a table. Oh, so you mean to tell me that the table that we have, that we eat our lunch on and dinner on, is like the altar? Why? Because the food that you eat is like the offerings. In the, if that's the case, then just like you need to wash your hands before bringing an offering, You need to wash your hands before you eat. Now, aside from the other health benefits that ironically or coincidentally match up with what halacha tells us. But the idea here is that the rabbis didn't just make up random things. The rabbis decreed certain laws, very few, that are all based in something that the Torah already teaches us. But they've expanded that idea to the areas that make sense for it to be linked. Because you can't make up something in Judaism. Everything needs to be sourced. It's a very, it's a very tricky thing. Oh, it's oral tradition. Oral. Or, or if you have, I've heard people say this, and it, it, you know there are not many things that irritate me. But this one is a big one. It's like that, well, it's just Midrash. As if the Midrash is just fairy tales. Because you know what happens when you do that to Midrash? First, not understanding. Just by the way, of the Midrash, like the Mechilta or the Sifri, you know who that was written by? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. You think he's telling you fairy tales? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar. You think he's telling you stories, Baba Mises? Absolutely not. He's giving you part of the story that you couldn't understand on your own. So you're coming to tell me, you bring every story from the Midrash, you tell me, ah, that can't be. Well, you have to know how to learn a Midrash. I want to address something, just uh, as as an interesting conversation to have. So Reb Moshe Feinstein of blessed memory, of holy blessed memory, was once in an argument with some modern-day rabbis. Modern day, you'll understand why I'm saying that in a second. So they got into this argument, and Reb Moshe, at the end of the whole discussion, it was going back and forth and back and forth. Reb Moshe said, listen, the halacha is as follows, and it follows my ruling, not yours. They said, that's arbitrary. What do you mean it follows your ruling? He says, I'll tell you why it follows mine. He says, because my ruling follows only Torah. I have never been influenced by secular education. I have never been influenced by secular books or movies. He says, each of you are very knowledgeable in secular knowledge, in secular books. You've been influenced and therefore your Torah is tainted. And it's not pure. Mine is pristine because I've never read any of those books. It's harsh. Wow. What do you mean? 
That means if I ever read a book about uh, John F. Kennedy, or if I read a book, you know, about the self-help or whatever, any book that you read that's influenced by, yes, that means that the level of pristineness or a holiness is slightly diminished. It's not pure, which is why when we talked about the 48 ways, one of those 48 ways is with purity. If you try to mix something into your olive oil, it's not virgin olive oil. It's lacking that purity. But it's still olive oil. That's true, but it's not pure. It doesn't make us a bad person, but it takes away the purity of the, of, of the person. And therefore, we need to understand, and to me, I hate to say this, but when, when I see, let's call them, People who are of influence, who have big congregations, who A, don't observe Shabbos, or B, are extremely steeped into secular writings, they're giving opinions about the Midrash? They're giving opinions about what Judaism should or should not be? When they don't observe the basic tenets of the Torah, of the Ten Commandments? It's like, to me, this is just like an unbelievable, I saw a video someone sent me of this reform rabbi standing in front of the pulpit, and he was giving a very good speech, by the way, a very good, very powerful speech, talking about how we've lost our morals, we've lost our ethics, we've lost our our our, our moral compass, but there he is standing in front of his congregation without a yarmulke on his head, and I ask you. Is this someone you can take seriously in Judaism? Again, it was a fabulous speech. But is this the person I'm asking for advice about how to raise my children Jewishly? What is going on here? The people who are not observing the Torah are giving their opinion about the observance of Torah? About what the Torah is telling us to do? I just don't get it. That doesn't mean that they're bad people. I'm not saying that. On the contrary. I'm the one who's saying that they're mistaken people and there are loving, uh, our, our dear, precious brothers and sisters. And we have to do everything we can to bring them in and learn with them and love them and teach them. They don't know. I'm not here to disparage reform rabbis. I'm not here to, to disparage conservative rabbis. I love them. I'm friends with many, many, many of them. The objective here is to realize that don't take your ignorance in Torah and make that your principles of Torah. If you don't follow your teachings of Torah, because what did we learn? We learned about this recently, that what happens is that when someone doesn't observe the Torah, they don't learn the Torah, then they start disparaging those who do observe the Torah, and then they start hating those who observe the Torah. It's an entire process of how this, how this it, 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 it disintegrates. I'm not saying that every person who speaks about Torah should have to live. I don't live everything I teach. I aspire to. I aspire to, and I definitely don't degrade things that are written explicitly in the Torah. There's a rabbi in our community who decided that some of the verbiage in Leviticus talking about homosexuality was offensive. The rabbi felt that it was arbitrarily, he felt that it was offensive. Who are you to say that God's Torah is offensive? Do you observe God's Torah? That you have the right to say that God doesn't know what he's talking about? Look, I don't walk around town telling people what they should or should not do or what they should or should not believe, particularly we're in a month, they call this Pride Month, people are out of their mind. That's their own problem. I don't go around pontificating this. That's not my business. Hashem tells it and Hashem can run his own world. I'm here to teach Torah. I'm not here to teach things that are divisive either, which is why we don't mention this. We don't talk about it. 
But the fact that people are out there, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not sad for Target losing $25 billion in a week. Good for them. They deserve it. And the same thing goes with Budweiser. They deserve it. There's a difference between someone saying, look, people have their things, th- things they, they do. It's your own account with the Almighty. It's your own account with the Almighty. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to love. I've had many people come in the doors of our Torch Center, say, do you accept gays and lesbians? I'm like, I accept every Jew. I never asked anyone who they sleep with. It's not my business. We're here to teach Torah. We love every single Jew. You want to come learn Torah? You're welcome. You want to come here and promote your agenda? That's not what we're here for. It's not for heterosexual or homosexual. It make a difference. We're here to learn Torah. You want to learn Torah? Let's learn Torah together. You're here to promote an agenda? That's not, our, that's not the place for it. You can go to the Federation for that. So what are we here for? We're here to understand what are the real values. What are the values that Hashem created his world with the principles that Hashem says, this is my world. I'm not here to correct anybody. I never never have. I never told someone, you, you're in my class for how many years? Did I ever tell you you're doing something right or wrong? Never. Never. Not even once. That's not our, our objective here. That's right. Our, that's not what we're here for. We're here to learn together and to connect through Hashem's holy wisdom, through Hashem's holy Torah, and to be as godly as we can possibly be. But for someone to have the audacity to say, Hashem's words in his Torah are offensive to me. So therefore, on Yom Kippur, we're not going to read this Torah reading. It, it's just, to me, it's, it's unreal. It's unreal. It's unreal, the chutzpah that some people have. Because that's what our generation has come to. Our generation has come to, it says that in the times of Mashiach, chutzpah yaske, what will happen is that chutzpah will be so prevalent People talking about God like he's their ex-friend. What does God know? It's like, you know, we've said about like atheists. Like what what are atheists? You think atheists are the guys who studied about God? No, they're the lazy people who said, "Ah, there's got to be no God. I'm just done with it. One day he's thinking, is there a God? Is there not a God? No, no God. Okay, that's it. Good job. Very intelligent. You don't find that the people who really invested in the wisdom of God are the ones who say there's no God. It's the people who are lazy that are the ones who say there's no God. Show me a guy who's studying in yeshiva and learning Torah. Show me one who says there's no God. One, one. The guy who's studying Torah. It is impossible to learn Torah and to not see God. So what? They just created for themselves a new category of people so that I can fit into something that makes me feel better about myself. It's all about how we feel. It's all about how we feel, not about about MS. It's not about MS. Hashem Elokechem MS. MS, MS. Hashem is MS. I'm sorry that Hashem's MS interferes with your feelings. Hashem's name is MS. Truth. All right, let's continue the Gemara. How did we get off on this? Yeah, accepting everyone. We do accept. We do, we absolutely accept everyone. You know, it's, it, it's another, another shocking thing is that they take the rainbow, which was the rainbow, which was the sign of Hashem saying, I eradicated the evil from this world. And Hashem says, I'm signing this covenant with the rainbow. That's the chutzpah here. The chutzpah of the generation that it says in the time of Mashiach is going to be such chutzpah, such blatant chutzpah. Here, Hashem, you made a treaty with the rainbow. We're going to show you. It's what we call a big oive. It's tragic that this is the generation we're living in that is really, it's, it's, 
It's concerning because every civilization fell apart when this became normal. It's, uh, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. All right, let's continue with Hillel. Omar lay taken aback by the change. The convert said to Hillel, Didn't you teach me yesterday the opposite, that Aleph was? What you're saying now is tough is really Aleph, and what you said is Shin is really Bez. Omar lo, he says, Didn't you trust me? Weren't you relying on me? to recognize the letters of the alphabet, the alpe nami smoich alei, rely on me also then about the veracity of the oral Torah. So by this demonstration, Hillel implied that without the oral tradition, the written Torah would be utterly inexplicable. Even the proper order and pronunciation of the alphabet would be unknown. Thus, the written Torah, in order for it to have made sense, must have been revealed along with an oral explication. A second story, a second narrative, again depicts Hill's interaction with a prospective convert. There was another incident involving a certain Gentile who came before Shammai. Amar lo... He said to him, He says, Convert me to Judaism on condition that you will teach me the entire Torah while standing on one foot. Meaning, just give, give it to me in the cliff notes. Give it to me simple. Don't make it so complicated. I just want to hear it straight. Okay? One thing, we know the Torah doesn't do, you know, We've studied hundreds of pieces of Talmud already, and we haven't even scratched the surface of the Talmud. He's like, I, I don't have patience for the whole thing. For the, You're going to tell me the whole Torah is going to take forever. I'm never going to learn the whole Torah. Just teach me what I need to know while standing on one foot. How long can we stand on one foot for? Not for too long. Upon hearing these words, Shammai pushed the person away with his ruler. He pushed him away with a stick that he was holding in his hand. Balifne Hillel, undeterred, the Gentile came before Hill and presented him with the same request. And Gaire, Hillel converted him. Amr lo, before the conversion, Hillel said to him, Da'alach sani l'chavrach lo savit. That which is hateful to you, do not do to your friend. To your fellow. Zo he kola Torah kula. Thus, in a few words, this is the entire Torah. The idoch pirusha, and all the rest is an elaboration of this. This central idea, that which is hateful to your fellow, hateful to you, don't do to your fellow. Zilgmar, now go and learn it. So it's, it's an interesting thing that Hillel says here. What Hillel is saying, if you just elaborate a little bit on this idea, what Hillel is saying is that it's not enough to just learn what is hateful to me, and I'll know what's hateful to my fellow. Expand that. Or say, just teach us, that when we talk about your fellow, what you're essentially saying is the Almighty. Your relationship with your fellow is a parallel or a comparison with how your relationship with God is. Because God is represented in all the people around us. So every person is a representation of the Almighty. Every person in our, in our world the Talmud and Sanhedrin tells us, Bishvili nivra ha'olam, a person should always say that the world was created for me. The world was created for me. What does that mean for me? You are your own world. Mark, you hear that? You are your own world. Everybody else is in their own world. What is our task? to bring together all of those worlds. 
So we not live in our own world selfishly. Take care of myself and that's it. No, on the contrary. We see the obligation in the Torah to take care of everyone else. Meaning we have to step out of our own world. How do we do that best? With understanding who Hashem is. You know, I was just learning with my study partner last night. This concept of bittel, the nothingness of the self. Eradicating the self. What does that mean, eradicating the self? We're very self-absorbed. We know ourselves very, very well. I know when I'm hungry. I know when I'm thirsty. I know when I'm tired. I know when I need the restroom. I know when I'm lazy. I know myself very well. How about the person sitting next to me? Why don't I know anything about them? That is the obligation for us to remove ours because if we're not able to connect with our fellow, we're definitely not able to connect with the Almighty. And the only way to do that is to remove the self, the selfishness, the self-absorbedness. What Hillel is telling this convert, if you really, really want to know the whole Torah, standing on one foot, know this one foundational principle. What you hate, don't do unto your friend. You hate being neglected, don't neglect the Almighty. You love being connected, connect with the Almighty. You'll know everything. Abraham didn't have a Torah given to him yet, yet he followed the Torah. How did he know that? Because he had this one principle. One principle that guided his entire way. If you look at the commentaries, Marsha suggests that, so he says like this, he says that this convert wished to know whether the Torah could in fact be made to stand on one foot. That is, whether one could identify any single foundational principle upon which the entire Torah was based. Shama replied to him in the negative, pushing him aside with his ruler, used to measure foundations of buildings. Through this gesture, Shammai implied that just as the building cannot stand on a single pedestal, but rather is made with a broad and well-laid-out foundation, so too the Torah cannot be reduced to a single principle. Rather, its precepts are broad in scope and cannot be neatly summed up into one statement. So now we understand why he pushed them away with a ruler. This is a ruler for a foundation. You have to understand that in order for the Torah to stand, there needs to be a foundation. You can't just put it on one principle. The basic question presents itself here, Hillel's dictum, and that is, that which is hateful to you do not do to your fellow. It seems to provide an accurate summary of the Torah's laws governing relationships between man and his fellow man. But how does it summarize those mitzvahs that deal with man's relationship with God? So Rashi deals with this and offers two approaches. Number one, Sehillel's dictum in fact applies only to mitzvahs that govern man's relationship with his fellow man. Nevertheless, Hillel's words are an accurate synopsis of the Torah since they summarize most of the Torah's commands because most of the Torah's commands is how to deal man with their fellow man. In another approach, Rashi suggests that the phrase, do not do to your fellow, also means do not do to God, like we just explained. Indeed, in Scripture, God is sometimes called a rea, a fellow of man. Under this interpretation, Hillel's dictum exhorts us to follow every mitzvah in the Torah just as one finds it hateful. When someone disregards his wishes, so too one ought not disregard God's wishes as embodied in the mitzvahs in the Torah. God tells us how he wants us to conduct ourselves. Now again, God doesn't just tell it to us in a vacuum. Because God, who's our manufacturer, our creator, says, if you want to have a relationship with me, this is what you need to do. 
if you want to maintain that relationship with me, this is what you need not to do. Not the, the commandments of kosher, for example, are not to tell you, eat this, don't eat that. Rather, it's telling you eating this can create the vessel through which we can connect. And eating that which I tell you not to eat is going to block those channels of us, our connection with the Almighty. There are things that a person, if a person eats where the Torah tells us not to eat them, the spiritual connectors, the spiritual receptors are going to be clogged. And therefore, one is not going to be able to connect to God in the proper way. Now, of course, we know, just to make it very, very clear, that everything that we mentioned today needs to be put into perspective. Of course, number one is we're not judging anyone. But number two, we have to remember that God always welcomes us back. God wants us to be on the right path. Hashem wants a relationship with us. Hashem desires a relationship with us. And therefore, what we need to do is to recognize, you know what? If we made a mistake, we had a miscalculation, a misunderstanding, that's fine. Hashem wants us close. We say, Hashem, I'm sorry, just like you do with any relationship, with any human being. You hurt their feelings, you insult them. What do you do? You go over and be a mensch and you say, I'm sorry. And what happens if they're nice? They'll say, okay, I accept your apology. Hashem is forgiving. Hashem is loving. All we need to do is approach Hashem and say, you know what? I made a mistake. I ate something I shouldn't have eaten. I went someplace I shouldn't have gone. I did something I shouldn't have done. Because Hashem loves us and he wants that relationship with us. The Marsha notes that Hillel's words are apparently based on the biblical commandment in Leviticus 19 that says, You should love your neighbor, your fellow, as yourself. Yet, whereas the Torah, the Torah phrases this commandment in the affirmative, love your neighbor, Hillel seems to give it only a negative application. Do not do to your fellow. Hillel limits the passage in this way as the Maharsha suggests, because these words appear immediately after the negative commandment, lo sikom lo sitor, that you shall not take revenge and you shall not bear a grudge. This implication is thus, that the maxim of love your neighbor is primarily defined in terms of what one ought not to do to someone else, someone's fellow, someone else, rather of what the, one ought to do for him. So, the negative that we're hearing from Hillel of thou shall not do is taking the entire picture of that verse. Do not take revenge. Do not bear a grudge. As we recently explained in our Musser masterclass, we talked about Judaism isn't extremism. And you don't find any extremism in Judaism, ever. You show me an extremist, I'll show you how it's not Jewish. 100% of the time. There's no extremism in Judaism. Everything, you look at the Rambam, you look at all of the books of halacha in Judaism, you won't find one time that there's extremism. It's normal. It's level-headed. It's like Rabbi Brody said yesterday in the brand spanking new Torch podcast of Likute Maharan with Rabbi Lazer Brody. He says, God isn't a seven-syllable word. It's not about, if if God is complicated, you're misunderstanding God. God is glot. God is simple. But we think sometimes if someone makes a mistake and we say, oh, repentance, what am I going to do? How am I going to seek atonement for the things I've done if God only knew what I did? What do you mean? God knows exactly what you did. And God still says, I'm giving you oxygen another day. I'm giving you opportunity another day. Why? Because he wants you to come closer. All you have to do is beficha ubilvav chalaso. So it's within the ability of your mouth and your heart to attain it. How? Just say I'm sorry. Just say I'm sorry. That's it. Hashem, you know what? I have regret. I shouldn't have done it. I over. I got carried away. I got self-centered. There's nothing wrong with a person saying I made a mistake. That's perfectly fine. We all make mistakes. 
All right, my dear friends, have a great Shabbos. It's an excellent question. You're saying that the modern Betin is, is pushing people away from conversion and not doing what Hillel did and just accepting them as converts. So if you, if you really pay attention to what the Talmud says, the Talmud says that it points out how the convert didn't give up and came back. It's one of the places that our sages learn that you're supposed to push them away and they're supposed to show a level of insistence. That's exactly where they learn it from. You have to show that you're insistent and that you're not going to give in. I want it, and I'm, and I'm going to show my Jewish tendencies of never giving up. That's part of the objective here, is to ensure that this person is for real. Because if someone comes in and says, oh, I want to convert. You know how many people started the conversion process, and they're just like, you know, three months later, they're like, you know what, it's not, it's not really for me. Imagine they would have said yes day one, or they do the $1.99 conversions that others do. Come in, fill out the application, pay the fee, and we'll convert you tomorrow. No problem. Oh, come to a class, a conversion class. I wasn't able to make it, Rabbi. When's the wedding? All right, we'll do it before the... It's like, it, it, you understand, it's not... It's become a joke. It's become a joke. The whole conversion thing has become a joke. No, the halacha says specifically, it needs to, they need to be pushed away. They need to want it. They need to really want it. <laughs>